picked it up. Like, I think this came out in 2019. So he was working on Queer Eye at the time. So it was basically up to and including how he ended up on Queer Eye. Oh. And now I'm listening to his new book, which is called Love That Story, Observations from a Gorgeously Queer Life. It's so good. I'm almost done. And honestly, for both books, if you're going to read it, do yourself a favor and get the audiobook. Like just, I'm sure it's fine reading it with your eyeballs, but like, it's so, so good in audio because JVN reads it himself. Oh, good. It's exactly kind of what you imagine. It just feels like he's talking to me and just like sharing all these things and love that story is not a memoir. And actually, Observations from a Gorgeously Queer Life is a pretty good way to put it. It's less raw, and each chapter has a different theme. So each chapter is kind of like an essay. And so there's chapters where he covers cannabis and body issues. There's one about turfs and how that really made him change the way he... Because he was a huge Harry Potter fan. And basically, you can sum up that chapter with, like, fuck J.K. Rowling unless she wants to apologize and, you know, make some just make some gigantic donations to trans organization <laughs> uh, talks about imposter syndrome and the HIV safety net. Cause he's very open about his own HIV status. It's really, really good. And there was one chapter where he talks about learning more about the queer history of his hometown, Quincy, Illinois, which for queer eye fans, you'll remember Quincy from the episode when they go back and they make up Kathy, they do like the makeover on Kathy Dooley, his old high school music teacher. You know, it was it was really cool hearing him talk about how like he didn't realize he just thought it was such a conservative place. And like it is it is a conservative place. Like I'm not going to mm-hmm. say it's not, but he had no idea like the rich queer history that was there. He didn't know about the gay bar that was uh, owned or hosted by by this uh, fabulous drag queen who made everybody feel welcome who came in and kind of all that. And I thought, huh, I wonder about the queer history of my hometown where <laughs> where I grew up uh because he was specifically talking about where he grew up not where he lives now because he lives in LA and so I didn't dig into Calgary's history because that's where I am now but I looked up Windsor Ontario which is where I grew up right on the Windsor Detroit border I grew up about a half an hour outside of it in a little bedroom community and I was actually shocked I came across an article where they interviewed a local history teacher who had done like a ton of research into all of this. He's a, he's a queer man. And there's this like really, really rich history that goes way back in that area. And so I thought I would share um, a little bit of that because I just found it so interesting. It actually starts in 1842. So first of all, the fact that there's even information that goes back right. so far <laughs> is incredible. Literally 15 minute walk. From where I grew up and where some of my family still lives, there were um, there's a, a a fort that was there, and two of the soldiers, two men, were arrested for sodomy. I mean, unfortunately, some of these things I'm going to share at first are not happy stories. They were arrested for sodomy. They were sentenced to hang. They were believed to be one of the first cases of people who were sentenced to be executed for participating in gay sex. I guess. Thankfully, the governor general was like, um, "Let's not kill these dudes." Please and thank you very much. So um, unfortunately, they stayed in prison. But like, that's as far back as it goes. And really, like, that far back in Canada's documented history. There was also a local police auxiliary in Windsor that was set up to patrol the local parks. Everybody thought it started because of a serial killer. And there was a serial killer, but it was because the serial killer was targeting gay (sighs) men who were seeking sex in those parks. And that auxiliary wouldn't have happened without it, which I have mixed feelings about because they're mostly just looking for gay men. Canada's first bathhouse raid was actually there. It's largely forgotten because it was small. There were only like nine people who were involved, but that was the very first one in (laughs) 1964. And that particular bathhouse was actually really important because it was part of what was called a gay commute between (laughs) Windsor and Detroit. So often gay men from Windsor would go over to the bathhouses in Detroit and gay men in Detroit would come over to Windsor because like if you were from Windsor and you were arrested in a bathhouse you would end up in the local paper you would be ruined (laughs) if they went to Detroit they would be protected which I thought was super interesting the first AIDS death in Canada was in Windsor which again I was just like holy fucking shit so many firsts 
which was a little overwhelming to read about all in one place. But it was also pretty amazing, some of the other stuff. So, like, it was Windsor was the third city in Canada in 1977 to include protection for sexual orientation in its collective agreement with municipal wow. employees. Right? There was well, a, yeah. There was a law professor from the University of Windsor, which is where I have my undergraduate degree, Doug Sanders. He was the first openly gay man to address the United Nations in 1992 to talk about protecting minorities. And of the eight couples that went out and fought and were were responsible for same-sex marriage happening in Canada, one of them was from Windsor. Wow. And so I just thought, and again, this was before, like all of this I was looking up even before what we, you know, learned about with Roe v. Wade and the potential implications for LGBTQ rights and all of that. Like, I found it so interesting and also empowering in a way, really, to see. And there were other there there were other cases of like people fighting and winning rights and all that, and specifically people from where I grew up that were responsible for this, for this progress that we've had in Canada. And I just found it so heartening because, again, it was that, like, I, I think we've talked about this before on the show. And it's probably going to become a theme. We've done this before. Like, as a people, the community have come together before. And we can do it again. And, like, seeing those examples and knowing that they came from the same place I came from, I found really, really inspiring. And so I would say, look up your hometown's LGBTQ history learn about it, draw strength from it too, and see what it inspires you to do. 